This is the Church of Now podcast. We appreciate you listening, and our prayer today is that we can bring insight to help you become a better leader, no matter what generation you're a part of. Hey, we are uh, you know here on the Church of Now podcast. Uh, it's been a month or so since the last episode, but I'm excited. We have a guest, Courtney Daly. Uh, met Courtney through, really, I guess, your son, uh, youth group for a while in church, and so, man, I know a lot of people here love your family, and uh so why don't why don't you just kind of introduce yourself a little bit tell us about your background uh what you're doing now and maybe a little bit about your family yeah thank you so much for having me matt i'm really excited to be here um i do yeah i met you through poplar ridge i love my poplar ridge church family like i started going to poplar ridge at some of the hardest years in my life and the people of poplar ridge just loved me up and it, it was the it was the first true example that I had ever seen of just loving, amazing Christians who pour into each other. And I know you're a huge part of that there. So I right. love everybody there and I love being a part of this. Um, right now we go to church at Central Community Christian Church. It's over here close to our house. Piney yep. Glass is just a little too far for us. <laughs> but um, yeah, we we are really, really active. We love our church family here. And I'm able to teach some in the high school girls class. And I've done a couple of ladies classes. I grew up um, in a very conservative church and with a very conservative family. I'm I'm a PK, preacher's kid, elder's kid, missionary's oh. kid, all of that. So I grew up most of my life in church every time the doors were open. And I started teaching the kids class from the time I was like 12. I was, by the time I was 14, I was teaching the ladies classes, all that stuff. But I fell away from church for years, for like 10 years. Yeah. And when I came back, I really had a very strong passion. I owned my own faith for the first time in my life. And it was different. It was very different from the Christianity that I grew up with. And because of that, I feel very passionate about sharing messages with Christians who have either fallen away or maybe they carry a lot of shame, a lot of sin in their lives. And I love being able to just shine God's light on that and help people and help people through church hurt too, because I went through a lot of church hurt in that time. Um, so now we live, um, right in between Elizabeth and Johnson city. I am married to Paul Daly. We just got married four years ago and he came along with two amazing bonus sons, one (laughs) of whom was just baptized on Sunday. That's awesome. So awesome. And then, um, I also have Jackson and Lissy, my two kids. So we're all just one big happy family. Yep. I love it. Uh, we're going to kind of get into some of your story here in a minute, but before we get there, I, I'm just curious, you know, the Church of Now podcast, I know that you believe in everybody kind of having that role. You know, I know that you want your kids involved. I know that you want to be involved. And so like, as, as we think of the Church of Now, what do you think that means? Like, what is it supposed to look like? What are some, I know that you've seen some unhealthy characteristics of the Church of Now. Uh, what are some healthy characteristics of a church that uh, believes in everybody having a role. Yeah, I think that's the biggest starting point for me is I know what the church of now isn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the church of now isn't. I think that we're in a really scary time in our world right now. I mean, we're at a time where people are turning on Christians. We're being persecuted for our faith. We're being canceled. We're being belittled or shunned for speaking the truth, like we're at a point right now where the church of now is crucial Mm. to the future, to the future of America, frankly. And I see a lot of church members, I feel like, who are doing what we shouldn't be doing, like (laughs) getting online on social media and arguing about (laughs) politics or fighting or spewing hatred. And I think now more than ever, you know, God calls us to be a light. And in Matthew 5, he says, if you're a light, a city on a hill can't be hidden. And if we're really shining his light and we're really focusing on the things Jesus focused on, you know, we can we can talk about the rules and we can shun people and you're wrong for doing this. You're wrong for doing that. And I get it. There's a place for law and commandments and all of that. But if you look at Jesus ministry and what he did, he went 
and he healed people and yeah. he cast out demons and he raised people from the dead and he fed people before he ever sat down and taught them. He fed them first. And I think that we have a world right now that is hungry for truth and to be fed that and they're hostile and they're divided. And it seems like, man, the devil has got this great tactic because we are at spiritual warfare, right? I mean, we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to talk about the devil, right? but we're in spiritual warfare. And if he can take our army and turn us all against each other, like what an effective tactic, because if we're all fighting with each other, we can't fight the real enemy. Yep. And I think, you know, the, the church of now needs to be a church that looks to Jesus's ministry. Love, 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 love people. Shine that light and reach people. Yeah, so many times we fall into the trap of being a kind of putting on our boxing gloves for Jesus. And, you know, we, we don't have to do that. He's already won. <laughs> and so we don't have to yes. bring that light anymore. Um, but we, I mean, I just talked about this on Sunday morning. We have to be unified you know, and the church, the church uh, or people will know that we're followers of Jesus, by the way, we love and Satan would love for us to be divided. That, that's his goal. We got to be united. And so I love that. Uh, we got to love so well. So, you know, we met through church. Uh, I know that you're writing and you're an author and you're doing a lot of those things right now. And some of this comes into play with your story, but also you've written some other things that, um, you know, that you're just interested in. But thinking of your story, um, this is what I feel like most of the people that I know that you know talk about um, uh, with you is kind of your your church story. Uh, growing up in church, um, you know, you mentioned conservative, very conservative upbringing there. Um but there was that there was a moment that kind of shaped your your view of church or reality of what that looks like in your late twenties, and I, I think it's valuable. I think it's valuable as we talk about the church of now um, to recognize some of the some of the problems, but also out of that some of the resolutions. And so, tell us a little bit of your experience that's shaped your faith over really your entire life. Yeah, I think that a lot of it was I started out thinking the whole time growing up in church that I needed to be perfect mm. to make it to heaven. And it's like how many of us fall into that trap, right, where you can take your Christianity just like the scribes and Pharisees and you can turn it into a checklist of laws and commandments. So my whole life, I was like, well, if I can do this and this and this and this, I can be perfect. I can be perfect. And I tried to look perfect on the outside and I made really good grades growing up. And I was like the epitome of Pollyanna. <laughs> and when we had prayer request time at church, which this is the way it is at most churches, like you ask for prayer requests and people are, oh, pray for this person. They're having surgery. Pray for this person. They lost a loved one. And that's all important. Like we need to pray for those things. But nobody ever speaks up and says, hey, I need you to pray for my spiritual sickness. Yeah. Because, you know, God tells us in James chapter 5 or 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. And at the end of that, why? So that you may be healed. Yeah. Because God knows that when we confess what's going on in our lives, it brings healing. And I never confessed sin. I was like way too perfect. I tried to be perfect. I wanted everybody to think I was perfect. So in, when I was 29 years old, I left my ex-husband. And when I left him, no one knew the struggles we were having because yeah. I was the Bible class teacher. We had the youth at our house a couple of nights a week and he was the song leader. And we had this adorable little boy and on the outside, on the outside, we looked like we were so perfect. And for years, I never shared with my church family or my friends or my family what was really going on behind the scenes. And I think that was the catalyst for what caused so much of the fallout. Because when people saw, oh, my word, like Courtney just left her husband and I was on a very high 
pharisaical horse. Mm. And the higher the horse, the harder the fall. Yeah. And instead of my Christian brothers and sisters, you know, rallying around me, I mean, like they rallied, but it was like with pitchforks and burning torches. <laughs> like everybody was so excited to just sit back and watch it all go down in flames. Yeah. And they were really quick to just judge immediately. Like, she has gone off the deep end. There is no excuse for this kind of behavior. Oh my word, she's she's giving the church a bad reputation. She's giving the family a bad reputation. And in one night when I left, I literally, I mean, it was the beginning of it, but I lost my home, my spouse, my family, my church family, my income, and most of my friends all yeah. in one night. Hmm. And um, it was about, I guess, a year later after my divorce, that the eldership of my church at the time, I want to clarify that it was not Poplar Ridge or the church. <laughs> That's right. It was now, not. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. Um, the church where I was attending at the time really believed very strongly in church discipline, which I mean is biblical, right? I mean, we're not supposed to keep company with a brother or sister who is out of line, who's not living right. Um, so it was a Sunday morning uh, and I actually got a text that afternoon from a church friend and she texted me and said, Hey, like, did you know they disfellowshipped you at church this morning, which disfellowshipped, I didn't know this at the time, but like other people don't use that word, but that's, it's basically like shunned, like they shunned you. And I was like, for real? <laughs> like, no, I did not know that. And uh, she was like, yeah, they, um, they cut you off because they told me that I couldn't date. They didn't believe that I had any grounds to start dating again. And they said, if you start dating again, you you will be disfellowshipped. Wow. So I was cut off. And <laughs> it's people, you know, ask, like, so you know, what what is it like to be shunned <laughs> from the church? And I can't even really begin to tell you because it's like everything that you used to do that was normal everyday stuff, like going to the grocery store you run into somebody in the frozen food section and they grab a hold of your grocery cart and tell you for 10 minutes about how you're destined for eternal condemnation or yeah. like you get these messages on facebook messenger i got messages from people i had never met and people like to this day if i passed them on the street i wouldn't even know who they were i had people coming to my house leaving letters um, on my house, under my windshield. I got letters in the mail. I have 58 single-spaced pages of letters from people. A few of them were written in love, but most of them were just, wow, you were raised in the church and you've gone off the deep end and you're lost and there's no hope for you. And you've gone down this horrible path and there's no coming back from it. Just like, boom, boom, boom. Just beating me down, beating me down for years. And um, unfortunately, that's like, the, <laughs> that's my story. Like, that's what everybody knows now is, is what I went through. And I don't like focusing on that part of the story. Because that part of the story is not what matters. What matters is what happened after that. And um, I fell away, really, it was about 10 years. Instead of it working, what those people were trying to do, which I really do believe a lot of them yeah. had good intentions, right? I mean, they, they really thought they were doing what was right to try to bring me back, but it sent me the other direction. Yep. And I never had a drink in my life, right? <laughs> but I was like, oh, you know, you think I'm a heathen? I'll show you. And I started partying yeah. and I went off the deep end and I became everything they said I was, mm. which is just so ironic to me. So yeah. it, I, I wish that it just lasted a few years. It didn't, it lasted a really long time. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I finally had a friend who got me into Christian counseling that she made me sit down and say, Courtney, like you you've got to the problem is not the labels people put on you the problem is you're still wearing them mm. and you need to look at what god says versus what people say yeah 
goodness so uh, I'll, I'll pause and say this that that's the, kind of the anomaly with the church <laughs> uh you know like if you're listening to this and you're like oh my gosh that's why i don't like church it, like like that doesn't happen like that yeah. that like that is it probably especially now in our day and age i think that wouldn't happen as much but the reality for you is it did and i mean that that affects a lot that, that i mean that changes a lot of things um, and there probably were a couple of people that thought that they were, you know, trying to help out. Um, yeah. but it goes back to what we mentioned earlier of the healthy characteristics of the church of now. It's like, man, yeah. what if they would have just surrounded you and loved you, you know, in, in a, in a, in a healthy way. Um, and that's what we're called to people make mistakes. Like we, we, we all make mistakes and I'm not even saying that that was one of them, but like so many times we see our brothers and sisters, getting angry picking up stones and they don't even know the full story you know and that that's a hard part a hard place to be yeah so i've heard that people i'm sorry i'm interrupt you go ahead. i've heard that people in the world say that the church is the only place where they shoot their wounded <laughs> yeah and, that's and that's, awful. but that church where i was going i mean that really was what it was like like oh you're nope we can't handle this like we're done we're done with that's, you and that's hard and as you look at the life of jesus i mean that wasn't him. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you look at some of the church leaders in Jesus' day, and that was some of them. But that's kind of the human side that breaks out as we, we can all, you know, become a Pharisee in some way. Uh, but Jesus was never like that. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he loved people well. And even the people that had made mistakes, you know, he was like, hey, don't make mistakes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't hate you, but don't make mistakes. And, you know, and not that you don't, there's grace, but don't continue to live your life in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so many times we pick up stones and, and that's, that's not what we're called to. Jesus dropped his, he, he was the only one in that, in that story in John chapter eight, who didn't even pick up a stone and he could have. And right. that, that, it, it's, uh, it's kind of mind boggling to hear some of those stories. Um, anyways, yeah. uh, we'll move on from that a little bit. So tell me, a little bit about the the healthy side coming out of that so you you mentioned uh, you were out of church for a while i know that you mentioned church counseling or uh, christian counseling but what is kind of what does your faith look like on the other side of that um and maybe what that would what that journey looks like for you this is the crazy thing matt okay like i was in counseling and and the lady was like i want you Sasha Channel. I got to give her a shout out. She's right here in the Tri-Cities. She's amazing. She's awesome. Sasha, S-A-C-H-A, -S Sasha Channel. <laughs> Not Sasha, but Sasha. Love she it. was great, but she told me that she wanted me to do homework. And she sent me home and said, I want you to take a sheet of paper and draw a line down the middle. And on one side, write what everybody says about you and back it up with scripture. Mm. Like, great. That sounds like fun. Ouch. <laughs> so then on the other side, I want you to write what God says about you and back it up with scripture. And Matt, the thing that brought me back to, it's hard for me to talk about, um, is God's word. Yeah. It was God's word. And it was, um, oh, is it Hebrews 8, 12? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins will I remember no more. Yeah. That was the first verse I found <laughs> yeah. in the right column. And I mean, I, that night I fell on my face and I ugly cried for like two hours yeah. because I found these verses, um, like that, you know, we are all baptized into Christ and we've put on Christ and we're children of God. Mm -hmm. Like there were all of these things that were, Hey, confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There were all of these verses they just kept popping out. What is it in Romans um, where he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Yeah. I had never seen that verse in my life, or maybe I had, and I had just skimmed over it because I thought I was too perfect. But when I started seeing all those verses and they started jumping off the page, I lost my mind because it was like, God really spoke to my heart that night. And it was like, it doesn't matter what people see when they look at me because I realized I'm not perfect. 
you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, none of us are perfect. But when God looks at me, he didn't see the same thing that everyone else saw. He saw his son standing in front of me in my place. And because he sees him and because he was good enough and he was perfect enough to make that sacrifice, it didn't matter about my sins that were in the past. They were in the past. And God said that he had forgotten them. And that night was the turning point that changed everything. And the next morning I um, was having oatmeal with Paul, my husband for breakfast. And um, I started falling in my oatmeal. And like, he gave me that look, you know, that look that like all men give women when they're crying. <laughs> what did I do and how do I fix yeah. it? Like? <laughs> and I was like, I'm changing the whole course of my life. And he was like, okay, I support you. <laughs> Sounds like a big and I said, you know, <laughs> Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and um, I had been writing secular fiction books. I had submitted like three books. And I was like, I'm done. Like I'm scrapping all of that. Like I'm using my talents for God and I am going to speak about the grace that God has shown me. And I want to speak about the mercy and about overcoming the things that people have said. Really though, it wasn't even the things people had said. It was the things that the devil had been saying in my ear for years, all that you're condemned. You're not good enough. You're an orphan. There's no hope for you all of that stuff. And I was like, there is, there's a dying world out there that's hurting that they need this message. And I was on fire for God. And for the first time in my life, this may sound crazy to other people. It was epiphany for me. I've been going to church my whole life because I was supposed to be there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, vacation Bible school, gospel meetings. Like if there are weeds to be pulled at the church, we will go, you know, like that whole thing. Yep. And now I go because I thirst for it and I hunger for it. And I want to be with my brothers and sisters and I want to pray and I want to study his word, not because I'm trying to look perfect or because I'm trying to earn it, but because I love him and I'm so grateful for what he did for me. Yeah. And on the other side of forgiveness, and recognizing that it changed everything it changed my whole christianity all my perspective it's totally different now yeah man that's huge so there's probably somebody listening right now who has experienced some form of of pain you know when when it comes to the christian community and we all have it you know i've been i'm 26 i've been in church my whole life I've been on staff at a church for four years. You know, I went to Bible college. Like I, 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 I'm like the stereotypical, what they call quote unquote professional uh, Christian, just because I've been on staff, you know, and like, they're still struggling hurt, you know, like you experience that it's not, it doesn't have to be a drastic thing. Um, and it looks different for everybody. But, you know, somebody that's kind of gone through what a lot of us would call church hurt, like, what would be advice that you would give to them um, for somebody that's going, that's struggling with their faith, with their church hurt? You know, I think the biggest thing, Matt, is that this is nothing new. Yeah. Like, church hurt has been around forever. Like, you look at the New Testament, and Paul and Barnabas yeah. had this strong disagreement, and they went separate ways. Yeah. I mean, you look at the greatest victim of church hurt of our time was Jesus. Yeah. Jesus was crucified by the religious leaders and the people who led in the synagogue. Like, I mean, it's, it's nothing new. It's always been around and it's always going to be around, unfortunately, because the church is made up of imperfect people. And I think the sooner that we realize we all stink, (laughs) they really do. That was one of the things, by the way, that when I first started going to Poplar Ridge, I remember telling one of my girlfriends, I go into worship and everybody starts singing together. And there's like this general mindset, like we all stink. And she was like, what? (laughs) And I said, well, like nobody is standing up and being like, I've got it together and our life is perfect and all these people are wrong. It was very much this 
humble, the place we all need to get to. Yeah. Because we have to show each other grace. Yeah. And I think that was one of the biggest things for me when you realize how much you've been forgiven for. Mm-hmm. Well, how hard is it for us to forgive somebody else in church? I mean, you look at Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them yeah. when they were the ones crucifying him. Yep. So if somebody disagrees with us about like the color of the carpet <laughs> in the auditorium, or there's this awful mean girl click at church because it happens yeah. and somebody gets left out or somebody's being gossiped about or judged or condemned, or, you know, I have sat literally in church services where the preacher was preaching a sermon about these people who show up in t-shirts and ratty jeans and flip-flops on Sunday morning. And we had a visitor in front of us who I'd never seen before, who was in a t-shirt and ratty jeans and flip-flops. And I was just like, this guy is never coming back to church. Like it's, we're all imperfect and we're going to make mistakes. But I think number one, you have to realize that we're all imperfect, right? But number two, you have to, pray for those people yeah i have a list of enemies on my prayer list (laughs) every morning (laughs) that i pray for yeah and when you are truly praying for someone every day for years god will change your heart toward that person he will help you empathize with them because what is it they say about um holding a grudge is like um what poisoning your own coffee or or poisoning your enemy's coffee yeah it only hurts you it only hurts you. It only poisons you. It doesn't hurt the other person. It only hurts you. Yep. And, you know, I think beyond that, even beyond praying for them, like you just have to come to an understanding that we all make mistakes mm-hmm. and everybody's messed up. And if you can find a way, this is going to sound really messed up, <laughs> to serve the person who hurt you, yep. that is the greatest healer of all is when you can use the bad and turn it into something good. And I got a, I got a sign. I got a squirrel. Sorry, Matt. I feel like I'm talking so much. Oh, you're great. I have, um, there's this lady that I met a couple months ago and she had lost her son in a car accident, which teenage son. Yeah. Worst thing I can possibly imagine ever going through. And she went through this really dark phase of her life where she was angry at God. She tried to end her marriage. She tried to end her career. She didn't leave her house for years. And when she finally came out on the other side of it and she healed and she came back to God, she said people started showing up Mm. everywhere, parents who had lost their kids. And she told me, she said, Courtney, I pray to God, please know anything but this. (laughs) But when she started talking to people and started using her hurt and her pain in service to others and turning it into a good thing that's when the real healing began and i think it's the same way for us even with church hurt like wherever you have hurt in your life and whatever places that you've messed up if you can harness that and turn it around and use it to serve someone or to do something good like that's when the real healing began yep yeah satan would love would love it if he could take the pain that you're experiencing and make it even worse yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you can do what you're talking about, turn that around and use it. I mean, we all go through. I mean, I tell students this all the time. It's like, yeah, you went through a breakup. Well, in four years, yes, it's it's it sucks right now. But in four years, there's going to be somebody your age that needs your help. And so yeah. you gotta, you know you've got to you've got to get through it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Um, but you're going to be able to help somebody with it. You know, if you lo- if you lose a grandparent, you know, if you lose a, a parent, whatever, it's hard. But hopefully on the other side of that, you're going to be able to help them out, help somebody else. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's how God works. And sometimes it's not fun, but it's also just life. You're going to lose people. It's, they're going to be those things. So There are. And when you, I mean, when you look at the Bible, I mean, God gave us this big, beautiful book full of wisdom and stories and some seriously jacked up people. I mean, you have like Abraham and Sarah that Abraham and Sarah decided, oh, yeah, he should like sleep with her handmaiden because they didn't trust God to produce an heir. And then you have Moses who missed out on the promised land because he lost his temper. Yep. Like God gives us all of these examples of all of these messed up Christians 
who still had an amazing impact for him. Yeah. And I think personally that he did it because he wants us to know that, yeah, you're going to mess up and bad things are going to happen to you. That's life. You're on this earth. That's what's going to happen because there's sin in the world. But it's what you do on the other side of it. Like you said, what do you do with that to help others that makes all the difference? Yeah, you know, Peter, you know, denies Jesus, cuts off the dude's ear. But we still have these stories about peter and like the impact he made and you know the, he, he went on to preach the gospel like i mean it it's one of those things that we go through those hard times but god still uses it he still yeah, uses it. Does. He does. and so you mentioned you know you kind of came back in the church community you know a couple of years after all that stuff and i know right now you're loving your church community and um, I know that you've come and spoke to our our women here at the church and a couple of different people. And so like, what does that look like on the other side? Like the community piece, like what kind of role does that play uh, in your life um, as you kind of handle that stuff? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable because I am in this group that's a family. It's a family. Yeah. I mean, they love each other and they look out for each other and there's, there's no condemnation and there's a lot of authenticity. There are 10 women I could name right now in my church that I could call and say, this is my spiritual struggle. Let me get real and let me get ugly. This is what I'm dealing (laughs) with right now. And they would say, I'm praying for you right now. I got a um I got a message from one of the ladies in my small group this morning who knows that I'm going through something stressful this week. Yeah. Who messaged me at 6:30 this morning and said, "Girl, I'm praying for you. I wanted you to know I'm praying for you today and I'm praying for you every day." Yeah. Like that is so amazing to have that support system of people who surround you not in a we're better than everybody else way because we're not. We're just forgiven. Yeah. And the fact that you can be with those people, I, I've seen both sides of the community. Yeah. I've seen the community that was scared to talk to me because they were afraid of being put in the same category as me. Like I actually had a friend from the old church that just fellowshiped me and she would text me and be like, Hey, let's do lunch. And I was like, oh, awesome. Where do you want to go? Like, you want to go somewhere? You know, go to Amigos. You go? And she'd be like, well, like, we really got to keep it maybe your house or my house. I just don't want people to see us together mm-hmm. in public. And it was like, what? So when I went from that community to a community of love and support, yeah, it makes all the difference. Changes everything. Yeah, it does. If you have those people around you that love you, I mean, man, that and serve together. And I mean, it, it makes a big difference. Yes. Yes. How, would, how would your how does your understanding of forgiveness how has that kind of evolved over throughout your life because I, I can imagine as you go through that pain and again we've talked about this we've all we all go through these hurts these these painful things and so what does that what does forgiveness look like I mean how does how has that evolved for you um I think that growing up I didn't even I mean I'm just being real okay because that's what I'm all yeah. about being real <laughs> I don't think I even thought I really needed forgiveness. Yeah. And that is a horrible, nasty, awful thing to say. But yeah. I thought I was so perfect. And yeah. I was doing everything. I was practically earning it. I felt so self-righteous. And I I did not appreciate the sacrifice. Yeah. And when I went through everything that I went through with everybody, you know, being nasty and all that stuff and falling from grace, all of that, it was funny because of course, people started judging me and getting really nasty. And I got nasty right back. And here's the funny part. I was judging them for being judgmental. Yeah. So I became judgy. And I was really angry for a really long time until I realized, oh, God has forgiven me for all of this. And he tells us that he's not going to forgive us if we aren't willing to forgive others. Yeah. Ooh, mm-hmm. that's terrible. I mean, really, like, It's all, it all depends on us and what our heart is like. So I think forgiveness has been totally redefined for me. And I don't know, it, it gives me more grace for people too, because you never know what somebody is going through. 
When oh. you're sitting in Bible class and somebody comes in late and they're a mess, you don't know, but that their husband wasn't beating them before church that morning. Yeah. You don't know, but that they weren't out all night looking for their teenage son who's on drugs. You don't know what people are dealing with. You don't know where they're coming from. And to be able to look through that lens of mercy for others because the mercy that's been shown to you is a blessing. It makes you a happier person too. Like, I don't want to judge anybody. Like, that's a hard job. That's a job that belongs to God, <laughs> not me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I know that you've been writing for a while, um, you know, fiction and maybe some other things that I don't know if we can discuss here or not, but or, or looking into, and you can dive into that if you want to. But uh, so tell us about kind of your journey of being an author. Um, I know that there's some exciting things on the horizon for you, uh, but not just an author, a speaker, uh, just communicator. It's like your, uh, I don't know what your social media following looks like, but you always pop up on my feed. So I, I mean, I know that you're doing some really fun things on there. So tell us about kind of that journey for you of author, speaker, social media, what I don't know if you would categorize yourself as an influencer, but I feel like there's <laughs> there's some merit there. But tell us about I that. aspire to be an influencer, Matt. <laughs> I hope. I hope. <laughs> now I started um, I started trying to get into Christian fiction. Getting into tra to traditional publishing is a bear. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, so I started writing some Christian fiction books. And um, it has, I have been very, very blessed. The crazy thing is, so when I started out in secular fiction, I had 129 rejections mm. in secular fiction, which by the way, is not even like a lot. It, you get rejected a lot. <laughs> it sounds like a lot. But I mean, it, that's, it's still a lot, it's still a lot. Um, so I switched over to Christian fiction and within like six months, I, I started winning awards. Um, I landed an agent. Now I have an agent. We're out on submission with a book right now. And I started working on like telling my story on YouTube and stuff. Cause while I was at the writer's conference, I was meeting these other writers and I was still pretending to be perfect. Mm -hmm. People want to tell anybody my story because people get really awkward or I thought they would yeah. for me just to come out and be like, yeah, I was shunned from my church. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you never know how people are going to react to that. <laughs> But I started sharing my story with some of the other authors and they were like, this is powerful. You need to be talking about this. And I was like, mm, no, like <laughs> I've been silent about it for years. I didn't talk about it, but I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to get on YouTube. I'm going to start making some videos. I'm going to get raw and real. I named my channel sinners like me. Right. And I get this <laughs> call from my agent <laughs> and she's like, I feel like maybe we're sending the wrong message with sinners like me. And I was like, but we all need to like admit we're sinners together. And she's like, okay, let's just name it author Courtney Daly. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> but once I started talking about it and sharing all of these doors started opening. Yeah. And I, I feel like the Yoda of church hurt. I get <laughs> so many messages. I had two messages from complete strangers when I woke up this morning wow. because I have people reach out to me who are like, I'm going through this hard thing at my church and I don't feel like I can talk to anybody about it. Can we meet? Can we have lunch? Can I, will you talk to me about what's going on? And I'm like, yeah, because I think people are really hungry for authenticity. Like let's get real and let's talk about what's really going on. So all of a sudden I started, like I had um, somebody from the praise Jesus network reached out to me. I'd never heard of it before. And they were like, we want to do an interview. And then I started having people ask me to do ladies days and ladies classes and start teaching. And um, I think I'm about to write my first nonfiction book about being disfellowshipped. <laughs> as raw and painful as that's going to be. No, it's it's really not. It's because it's not about being disfellowshipped. It's yeah. about the other side of it. It yeah. really is. And I think that if I can write a study that's some kind of however many step process for how to heal from not only what people say about you, but what the devil is saying about you in your ears versus what God says about you. Yeah. I think everybody needs that. Everybody. everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's so funny as we were talking before this, you know, when I reached out to you, I thought that you had already started that, that book <laughs> uh, and, and that it was, you know, in the process and, you know, you can kind of tell your your story. You've been thinking about it a little bit, but 
Like, well, <laughs> tell, tell, tell everybody what you told me before of like, last week you talked about it and you know. It was so weird. So it was like probably two weeks ago. And in the mornings I have like my, my little hour of power where I meditate and pray and like get my brain right for the day. And I was meditating. I just finished praying and I was just trying to like be silent and be still. And it popped into my head. I need to write a book about being disfellowshipped. Like I need to put down the fiction pen for a little bit and write this study. And it was one of those moments where I got chills all over my body. And I was like, okay. And I told Paul, I was like, I think here's the weird thing. I write a lot of books. I get a lot of ideas for fiction all the time. My agent's like, stop, slow down. Cause I write all the time. <laughs> I don't have any new ideas for a fiction book right now. Mm. And I told Paul, I was like, I think it's because God wants me to write this study. I really think that. So then you submit to me <laughs> your list of questions for yeah. this, which by the way, I don't think I followed anything. Sorry. Right. I scrolling usually, all over the place. usually don't, but it's fine. <laughs> Sorry. But you sent me your list of questions and it was like, so I understand you're working on a book about your story. <laughs> Tell us about that. And I was like, I told Paul, I was like, what? <laughs> and God was like, get on it, Courtney. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, God works that way sometimes. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But we can we can say this is an announcement. Like it's it's gonna happen. <laughs> right. No, I definitely have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just got the green light from my agent yesterday. She emailed me. Yeah. And I was like, look, I've been I had already kind of pitched it to her and I was like, I've been chewing on this thing. And I, she was like, I think you should write it. Definitely write it. You need to do this. So you heard it here first, I guess. <laughs> yes, right. First official announcement. <laughs> that's so fun. Well, I've, I think that's really going to help a lot of people um, who have walked through so much and not just church hurt, but their own struggles. You know, uh, it's so easy to believe the lies, especially in our day and age where we're fed so much information um, yeah. and so much what everybody else thinks. And we all, I mean, I struggle with it. I think we all do. Um, but then just getting back to that, that true God's word, you know, I mean, here's what God says about you. It's, it's the other side of, of what we really need. And so I love that. So thank you for pursuing that. And I'm excited to see what that looks like, but you're already doing that with your life and with your teachings and your YouTube channel. And, you know, that stuff's already happening, but we'll just get it in writing, which will be fun. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> So, well, sweet, as we kind of finish up, um, I know that you have a lot of experience with church and you're leading right now in different areas. And so, you know, one of the biggest things for this podcast and this this thought process of the church of now is really just recognizing everybody has a place. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your experience, doesn't matter, you know, uh, what you've been through, but you have a place and a role right now, whether you're 80 or you're eight or you know, you're healthy or you're not, I mean, you have a role. And so what would be advice? We have a lot of, I think we have a lot of church members and leadership that's listening to this, um, just kind of from what I've heard from from others and looking at analytics and stuff. What would be your advice to maybe the leaders in the church uh, about what it looks like to understand and empower people of all different backgrounds to make sure they have a role? You know, I was, um, I was a church secretary at a church in Knoxville years and years and years ago before all this went down. And the youth minister had this little sign on his desk that I never forgot. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yep. And I mean, really, that was that was a Jesus thing. That's what Jesus did. And I think so many times it's just like you said, we just have to love. We have to love people and listen to people. But I think we also have to be approachable enough and real enough that people can come to us and say, hey, pray for my family. My daughter has an eating disorder yeah. or our marriage is about to split up or somebody cheated or, you know, whatever, whatever it is like the ugly real stuff is the stuff we just won't talk about. No. And I think it's because we're all so afraid of not looking perfect. I think social media has made that so much worse too. Yeah. Where everybody wants to put up this persona, like everything is merry and rose all the time. And it's not. And if, if we can all get to a place where we love each other and we're so close that we can go to each other 
when something is about to fall apart and we can get real and love each other through it. You know, sometimes, like with Paul and Barnabas, you do have to get to a point where you go your separate ways. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but not all body parts work together the same way. Yeah. We're not all compatible, and that's okay. We all have different roles in the church, and I think that we all just need to come to a place where we accept each other where we are. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge, and I think that if we work together, I mean, man, it's going to change everything. Yes. You mentioned yeah. it earlier. You know, we sometimes we argue over the color of the carpet or the paint on the wall. You know, it's just like I think Jesus would look at us and be like, "Really." I mean, come on. <laughs> I died on the cross for you to argue about that, really. Uh, I mean, man, it, we got to work together. Got to gotta be on the same page. And, you know, we can have our differences. We can have our different opinions and all that. That's fine. But as long as we have the same goal. Yeah. yeah. And when we're serving, we're not fighting. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> when, you're, when you're in one of those situations where you're going and you're doing, like, mission work somewhere or you're, you're really serving. You're not arguing because your focus is on him, not on each other. Yep. Yep. That's the goal. Work together. Be a part of the church. We all have a place. And so, well, sweet. Thank you for your time. Um, I I appreciate uh, the last hour or so that we've had. Uh, Thank you for using your voice and your story and your writing. I, I believe that a lot of people are impacted by what you do. So I appreciate that. Thank Anything you. else? Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. I just really appreciate the opportunity. I love to talk about the things that God has done in my life. So thank you for this platform. I think it's great what you're doing. And I think it's great that you wrote a book. It's <laughs> going to get you to a writer's conference. We're going to get you in there. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you.